Welcome once again to the Simple Truth. Last week I ended the teaching on the blood, and it's so much about the blood that, that we need to understand and need to know and to apply to our own lives. And, and it's, it's almost impossible to talk about the blood and then not talk about the anointing that comes after that. Uh, and so that's what I've titled these next at least two uh, Lessons on the anointing. Uh, I'm going to go back in the Old Testament and show the anointing there, uh, and then uh, show how the blood and the anointing works together, and the importance it is to us today in the New Testament church. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I want to bring in uh, the anointing oil, the holy oil. There's a special oil that was made, and we'll talk about that a little bit before we go on. So, uh, if you'll go to Exodus chapter 30. In the Old Testament, it uh, tells us a lot about not only leaving Egypt, but it also tells us the setting up of the tabernacle and, and those kind of things. And it's interesting to read these things and to try to apply them to our lives, <clears throat> not necessarily physically, but in the spiritual aspect of what they mean to us today. Uh, starting with verse 22, chapter 30, uh, Exodus Verse 22, uh, Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also take for yourself uh, quantity, uh, quality spices, um, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much uh, sweet-smelling cinnamon, 250 shekels is what that would be, 250 shekels of sweet-smelling cane, um, 500 shekels of uh, cassa, uh, according to the uh, shackle of the um, sanctuary and a hind of olive oil and you shall make from these a holy anointing oil an anointment compound according to the art of the per perfumer it shall be a holy anointing oil with it you shall anoint the tabernacle of meetings and the ark of the testimonies the table and all of its utensils the lampstand and its utensils and all the altar uh, of incense, <coughs> the altar of burnt offering with all the utensils and levering and its base, you shall consecrate them that they may be most holy. Whatever touch them must be holy. And you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister to me as priests. And you shall speak to the children of Israel saying, this shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. And it shall not be poured on man's flesh, nor shall be made any like, other like it, according to its composition. <clears throat> it is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever uh, compounds any like it, or whoever put any of it on an outsider, shall be cut off from his people. So, um, although he gives us a... a idea of how this is made but it's not he tells us how much and those things and, and really I'm not going into what those quantities means um, but that it was um, put together by someone who has the art of, of making perfume as we would call it today um, but I want you to understand that this was a special holy anointing oil with spices in it and, and olive oil so that it was a type of Holy Spirit. There's three things that we see um, that typifies uh, the Holy Spirit. One is the oil, uh, and it can be, I, I have come to the conclusion that it's olive oil that I use. Um, I, I'm not putting that as a, a law to you, but for me, that's my conviction. Um, it's a compound of spices like what we're seeing here uh, that's also used in burial when they anoint uh, a dead body. Uh, and then uh, the dove coming down is a picture of the Holy Spirit landing on someone. Uh, these are pictures of the Holy Spirit that, that are types in the Old Testament of what Christ is going to do in the New Testament through the Holy Spirit. Uh, so it's not so important, but understand that it says that nothing is to be made like it, to, to imitate it. Uh, this is a very, very special uh, anointing oil <clears throat> that was to be used once 
for the utensils of the of the temple, the tabernacle at this time, and of the priesthood to start the priesthood and and the Aaron's sons. And it it seems to me, okay, I I've tried to find whether this was just a one time or not, but it seems to me. And there again, my opinion, I'm not going to put this on anybody else, but my opinion is that this was only made once. And everything that was made after that was an imitation of this. Uh, this was the holy anointing oil, <clears throat> only approved by God. You know, I have, I have worked with chemicals in my lifetime, and, and it, it's almost like um, you, you can use the same chemicals, but if you don't, use them the same way or the same amount, you get something that's similar, but it's not true. Uh, it's just like uh, baking or, or cooking. Uh, you can have all the utensils and all the, the same things that, that the uh, uh, recipe says, but the way you put it together brings out something else. Um, I know <clears throat> we had we had a, a dish that a friend made that it, when she makes it, it's great. When we tried to duplicate it at her own house, wasn't the same. Uh, didn't taste the same. Uh, there was something lacking. And, and so I, I, I feel that this is like something that's a one-time deal. Uh, and you notice that it's, it's very important that it's not to be poured on man's flesh. Uh, and it's and if uh, on an outsider, so this is something you have to be a part of for the anointing to be on you, and it's it's typified through these things through what was being said. I don't think it's a matter of us knowing how much it was, <clears throat> other than than <clears throat> it was a special oil. So uh, this special oil was to anoint or to consecrate or to set apart those things for holy use and that was for the the worship and the and the and the offerings and that was going on in the in the tabernacle now I want you to back up to chapter 29 of Exodus and we're going to go to verse 1 uh, and I want to bring out some things in this about the high priest that when he was anointed. And, and this is what you shall do to them, to um, holy uh, them for minister as, to me as priest. Take one bull, two rams without blemish, an unleavened bread, unleavened case mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil. You shall make them of wheat flour. Now, <clears throat> unleavened was meaning with no yeast in it. Yeast is a is a picture of of sin, where a little yeast, as we're told, uh, can can uh, permeate the whole loaf. And so <clears throat> it was without leaven in it, without sin in it, uh, is what the picture there is. <clears throat> Verse three: You shall put them in a, one basket and bring them in a basket with the bull and the two rams and Aaron his son shall bring you shall bring to the door of the tabernacle of meetings and you shall wash them with water now the tor door of the tabernacle was the first curtain in the tabernacle in the wilderness uh, that was the first place they was to be brought there with their sacrifice <clears throat> And then there was the wash. Now, this washing uh, was a ritual washing that they went through. Um, it was a, a type of showing us what baptism is about, the washing of us. Uh, to For us now is to show the, the death and burial of, of our Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Um, it also can, can point us to, when I think of it, I point towards uh, the washing of the word that we learn from, from reading scripture and meditating on scripture and hearing the preacher uh, preach on, on scripture, uh, that it is a washing of the word. Uh, this is a washing of the body, the outward, but the word washes the inward. Uh, verse 5, and then you shall take garments, uh, put on the, put the, tunic on Aaron and the robe of the ephod, the ephod and the breastplate and gird him with the 
intricately woven band of the ephod, and you shall put a turban on his head and put a royal crown on the turban, and you shall uh, take the anointing oil, pour it on his head, and anoint him. Now, think about this. He's putting on the garments of the high priest. These are the garments of the high priest that we're talking about that he's putting on. The ephod had 12 stones on it. That represented the 12 tribes of Israel. So it's the completeness of Israel at the time. And that he wore that uh, representing the people to God as he'd ministered. Now, notice that, that it says that you will take the anointing oil and pour it over his head. He is in his high priest garb and the oil being poured over his head and dripping down over him and his beard and his clothing and everything. And this is, this is the only one that was anointed that way. The high priest Aaron was anointed that way. And then you see that, that it says that then you shall bring his sons and put tunics on them. In other words, here's a different thing. We've anointed the high priest. Okay. So we have one anointing. What that shows me and what it should show you is that we have that anointing of Jesus Christ because he is our anointed. We're told and believe that Jesus is the head of the church. Therefore, when he was anointed by God, it, that anointing went from his head over his body. And we are clothed in fine linen because of, of the blood that's been shed for us that we are are, are holy to him. So we are being, being covered by the anointing too. And that's what he's talking about here is that anointing of Aaron was a continuation. It wasn't just for Aaron, but all of his sons that became high priests was, was that under that same anointing, the same as you and I are under the same anointing of Christ. Okay, so then he goes on, he says, and then you shall, in verse 8, you shall bring his sons and put tunics on them, and they shall girt them with sashes. Uh, Aaron and his sons, remember Aaron was anointed high priest, and now he, he, he put in with his sons, sons, uh, Aaron and his sons, and put hats on them. The priesthood shall be their perpetual statement, or statue. Uh, so you shall consecrate Aaron and his sons. So, so here we have, this is a perpetual state. This is a continuum. The one sin is all we need. It is there. It will continue on. Uh, it doesn't need to be done over again in the sense. And then, um, <clears throat> then we have uh, verses 10 through uh, 5, I think, 15, I think it is, or 14 is uh, uh, the sin offering that is being given. And then 15 through 18 is uh, the trespass, the burnt offering that is being given um, <clears throat> that we don't do anymore. Jesus fulfilled all those things. We could take those apart and just show you where Jesus is in all of those things uh, for, our, for our trespasses, okay? Then verse 19, now listen to this. You shall take uh, the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands on the head of the ram. And this is talking about transferring of sin from them to the substitute, the ram, which Jesus is our substitute, uh, what we should have been condemned for, but through the love of God and the shedding of His blood, he is our substitute for, for the wrath of God and that we are transferring our sins on him. That's what it was shown when we repent of our sins and accept Christ as our Savior. Uh, then you shall kill the ram and, should, and take some of the blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and on the tip of the right ear of his sons, on the thumb of their right hand and on the big toe of their right foot. And sprinkle the blood all around on the altar. So, so here we see that they will be anointed again. Okay. This is not the anointing of the high priest as in first. That's a one time deal. But here they're being anointed. And, and when you look at these things, there is a symbolism that's going on here. When it says the, right, the tip of the right ear, the ear lobe of the right ear... And it shows 
that we are to be hearing and obeying God. That is our hearing part of it. The big thumb on our, our thumb on the right hand shows it as our service, our worship, and, and, and continuing into service with the Lord. And the toe of the right foot, the big toe of the right foot, as we call it, is the walking in the ways of the Lord. It is being like Christ to, in, in this sense. Of where we go, we are to take the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we are to work the works that Christ was doing, and that we are being priest for him. We are told that we are of a, a, a royal priesthood now that we're in Christ. And this is talking about where we go, we are to take Christ with us and we are to show Christ, uh, as Paul tells us, uh, not I that live, but Christ in me. Uh, we are to be showing him as we go. And these things are, are a picture of what the New Testament is trying to bring out to us and to show us in a spiritual sense. Here it was physical. Now we live in a spiritual sense of it. Okay. Okay. Um, now, uh, <clears throat> we, we also see that, that he is uh, showing us a picture here. Now, uh, in a book that Benny Hinn wrote uh, maybe 25 years ago called The Anointing, uh, he put the picture of, the, of being anointed in, in three states, okay? Uh, there's a, a leopard uh, leopard's anointing, uh, the priestly anointing, and then the kingly anointing. Uh, and I can see where he's coming from because in the Old Testament, when we talk about King David, he, he was first anointed as a, as a young man, uh, not yet of the age to be in their army, but, but out tending the sheep. And, and, you know, when you think about it, here's David, he's out tending the sheep, but all the other brothers have been called to the house because the prophet's coming to, to his father's house to anoint a king. Isn't it amazing that when that God will anoint someone <laughs> that everybody else leaves out? He wasn't even called to the feast, okay? But yet, when he was called and he was brought in, Uh, Samuel anointed him king then. Was he in the palace? No. He was still shepherding the sheep. And that's something that tells us that though we have the anointing, we're not to force ourselves into something, but we are to follow that anointing and keep doing the things that God has put before us in that sense. Okay, uh, He was later anointed the second time by Judea. The men that was fighting with him for him to be king over Judea, Saul still king over Israel. So there is another anointing there, a higher anointing, uh, a more prestige uh, anointing that's going on. And then we come to uh, the third anointing, which Israel itself anoints uh, David as king of Israel. Finally, after the third anointing, the greater anointing, he's come into the, the palace and is king, where before he was never, you know, king of Israel, uh, but he was working that way. God was bringing him that way and teaching him as he was go. Just the same as God is teaching us today. So we look at those uh, three anointings, and, and I take simply, you know, the names of them from the book. But I want to look at them in a sense, in a special way. Um, when we talk about the first anointing, the leper anointing, and if we go to Leviticus chapter 14, I want to show you the anointing, the, the forgiveness that comes in through that. Um, Leviticus chapter 14 and verse 23. Now here, we're talking about, <clears throat> about a leper, okay? They was not, uh, according to the Old Testament, clean. They had a disease of leprosy. Uh, they had to stay outside of the camp. They wasn't allowed inside the camp. And, and a matter of fact, when they, when they came around other people, they had to cry out unclean so that people would not touch them. 
and, and all those things. And so this is an outcast uh, that, that we're talking about. Uh, the same as, as we were outsiders to the kingdom of God before we got saved. So here, look, look, we're going to start with verse 23. Uh, he shall bring, and talking about the, 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 the one with leprosy, he shall bring to them to the priest on the eighth day of his cleansing and to the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. So he's not come into the camp yet. He's had washings. Um, he's gone through those things that need to be done prior to this. Uh, for us, it's repentance that we need to, to have first. Uh, and then we come to, to the door of the tabernacle. This is the first curtain uh, that before we can go in. We are not into the kingdom of, of heaven uh, by, re by repenting. It takes us to the door who is Jesus, to allow us in. Okay? Now, verse 24, And the priest shall take the lamb of the trespass offering and a log of, of oil, and the priest shall weigh them as a wave offering before the Lord. Uh, then he shall kill the lamb of the trespass offering, and the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering and put it on the tip of the, of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, the thumb of the right hand, and the big toe of the right foot, and the priest shall pour some of the oil unto his palm and of his own left hand. Then the priest shall sprinkle with his right finger some of the oil that is in his left hand seven times before the Lord, pointing towards the Lord here. And the priest shall put some of the oil that is in his hand on the tip of the right ear of who is it to be cleansed and the thumb of the right hand and on the big toe of the right hand and place the blood of, of the trespass offering. The rest of the oil he shall, that, that is, is in the hand, priest's hand shall be put on the head of him who is to be cleansed to make atonement for him before the Lord. Notice there are several things that we need to recognize here. First of all, this is someone who is outside of the camp, outside of the kingdom. That is unclean. Uh, that, that speaks to us being unsaved in that condition. We, we come to the door in repentance with the sacrifices that we made, spiritually sacrificing, okay? Uh, and in this sense, we're... we're uh, uh, talking about uh, our, our sins that we, we have. We acknowledge them in a sense and turn away from them. And we meet Jesus at the door. Here the priest is in the place of Jesus uh, as, a, as a picture here, not, not, not taking his, Jesus' place, but, but as a picture of, of him. Uh, Jesus is the door. So you see that then there is a blood sacrifice made. First of all, let's go back first. Before that, the priest takes the trespass offering and the oil and he weighs them before the Lord. Now, I, I, in my time of prayer this morning and, and my time of studying this before coming here, uh, I, I kept looking at this wave offering and it in a sense it is showing before the Lord so that he can totally inspect it that it is a good sacrifice that it is without blemish um, that the oil is not stagnant but but fresh oil uh, and and that it is acceptable to the Lord now this is a free will offering it is also called the free will offering when we go back into um, Exodus, I think it's like chapter 35, where Moses has been given the commandment to, to build the tabernacle in the wilderness. We come to that place, and, and I'll paraphrase it, that the Lord tells Moses, tell the people, those with a willing heart, give. So this is what's going on here. This uh, unclean person is willingly bringing this offering and it's being weighed before the Lord so that it can be inspected as, as we, ins, ins, 
are in repentance, we're being respected before the Lord. Um, then it says that uh, this wave offering has been given. The lamb is killed, pouring out the blood. It is without, you know, there's no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. We find that through Jesus shed his blood for us willingly. He was a willing sacrifice for us. And then it is applied to the ear, right ear, the right thumb, and the right big toe. And then after that, then the anointing oil, the oil is applied to the right ear, the right thumb, and the right big toe. Uh, so we see a picture here of, of the salvation, and that's what this anointing is really all about, the leper's anointing. It is for salvation. It is a picture of salvation, of coming into the tabernacle of the Lord, and to the holiness of the Lord. It is showing that we need to change our, be willing to listen, to hear the Lord, that we are willing to serve the Lord, and that we are willing to walk in the Lord. And these are all things that are being showed in this particular sacrifice for the, and then when he is cleansed, then he is able to be a part of the congregation. Just like you and I, that when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and we accept Him through His blood, that we are sanctified and brought into the kingdom of God. And we're no longer outsiders, but we're in the family of God. So we're seeing in this first anointing salvation. That is for you and I by accepting Christ and the sacrifice that He made for us, and to live for Him, and to be in service to Him. And we see that pictured in the Old Testament in this particular free will offering and salvation being brought, uh, the cleansing of our minds and our hearts to follow after Christ. And that's the thing that we should be looking at most right now, is accepting Christ, come to that repentance, come to the door of Jesus Christ, and ask for forgiveness. And when we do that, it's His shed blood that we are spiritually covered with. And then we are spiritually anointed through Christ, for He is the head of the church. So as we close today, I pray that you first accept Christ and His, and His blood, and then His anointing, because you are anointed. And we'll see you next week. God bless you.